Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ismail Mohammed, and I'm the director for the Center for the Creative Arts. It's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to the final event of the 24th edition of the Time of the Writer Festival. It's been seven days of inspiring, engaging, provocative uh, discussions with writers of various genres. From Zukiswa Warner's provocative keynote address that has pushed us all forward to think about the establishment of a literature foundation in South Africa, to the joy of the audience choice winner of the Young Book Reviewers competition, Nokukanya Tabula, who exclaimed that she will use the prize money to buy more books. The festival has unveiled both how much work needs to be done and the potential market that exists for South African literature. From Marion Times, a webinar that unpacked the festival theme, the writer, the witness, canary in the mind or testifier with Athol Williams, Brent Mirsman, Mandy Wiener and Temba Maseko to Michelle Constance webinar about the impact of COVID-19 on writers facilitated with Helen Moffitt, Nadia Davids, Emmanuel Taban and Carolyn Trotter all the way to Pumlela Kalenka's webinar this afternoon on navigating the publishing space with Temba Maseko, Kwanele Sifunda, Telempilo Tlatla, we put the writer at the center of our focus. From switching the spotlight on our featured author, Fred Komalo, to shining the spotlight on the winner of our inaugural literature champion, Dokozo Udlovu, to holding the light on veterans such as Zaik Da and Sandiwe Magona, we heard intergenerational voices of writers. From familiar festival voices like Nikum Plongo and Shafina Hassam to first time writers and festival producers like Koriswa Adedeni Ngema, we shared the online podium, giving each one the same place in the digital sun. From a program that featured voices in English, Afrikaans, and a specially curated program in Isi Zulu by Pindile Tlamini, to an Isi Kosa program curated by Zongi Sile Matshoba, to a public participation program that featured a dialogue in all of South Africa's official, uh, 11 official languages with themes about trying to survive, about how to su survive with the side hustle, to the more complex issues about colonialism, identity, and the making of place, to the everyday issues that plague our society, such as gender-based violence. We tried to be as inclusive as we could about the subjects that we need to talk about. From poets, novelists, short story writers, journalists, and academic writers, we tried to give gravitas to every voice. With more than a hundred voices, Regrettably that I cannot name all of them here this evening, which I would love to do, but they are all on our website. We officially mapped in our program, a growing number of audiences every day from, from the Monday that we started. Uh, we made it possible, all this was made possible through a partnership with the University of KwaZulu-Natal, the KZN Department of Art and Culture, the French Institute of South Africa, the Sustaining Theater and Dance Foundation, the Amazwi South African Museum of Literature, the Ibiza Journal for African Writing and the Foundation from, for Human Rights. In the engine room of the festival, we had a team of passionate people that kept food for thought, cooking with five daily curated mealtime program slots. I salute my team, co-curators in Sipindele, Chelsea, Hlongwa, Cedric Sissin and Pendile Glimini, who were co-partners in curation. I also want to thank our partners at Hear My Voice, incredibly young people, powerful, dynamic, uh, people that you can rely on enormously. Ismail Sibiya, Mo Afrika Mohadi, and Pomolo Sikamotu. I also want to thank our marketing guru, uh, Marlene Knoll, and her team, without whose work we would not have been able to, to get the message about the festival to our, our public. To our backstage people, Wesley Maheri, Yenzin Daba, Cheryl Rampele, Sikombile Miyende, and Bash Siddiq, I express our, our enormous gratitude for keeping the fire is burning. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight is the last of our programs. Enjoy it. It's also the prelude to, get what, to what we're going to present later this year in the 25th edition of the Poetry Africa Festival. Tonight we have poets from all the, the, the areas of Africa, Central Africa, North Africa, East Africa, uh, and South Africa, so enjoy this. But before I hand you over to the host for tonight, Mohari, uh, Mo Africa Mohari, I want to uh, play you a small note from our sponsors, the Foundation for Human Rights, and we 
Uh, I'm singling out this one particular sponsor today, specifically because it is Human Rights Day and the, the partnership that we have with the Foundation for Human Rights is incredibly important. So let's go for it. Enjoy the evening with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Stan Foundation. I am Sarah Mota from the Foundation for Human Rights. I couldn't be live due to connection uh, problems. Uh, however, as the foundation, we are fully supporting this event today, which is our National Human Rights Day, focusing on poetry. Um, I've been listening through the live uh, streaming of the event and really critical issues coming out around the lived experience of vulnerable groups uh, in South Africa, including people uh, who have lived in, in farms and people who have experienced the identity issue that was caused by the arrival of the settlers in the 1600s. Uh, as the foundation, we work to support, as we are doing today, programs that are around promoting uh, rights awareness broadly amongst vulnerable groups so that they can be able to take necessary action to access justice. Talking of accessing justice in this way, we have also uh, developed uh, more than 20 episodes on the constitutional rights for all South African uh, citizens and all people living in South Africa in order for them to easily read their rea reality using audiovisual med medium. So it's 20 episodes focusing on the constitution um, on a range of rights such as the right to equality, right to education. But what's important, each episode gives you a place or a contact uh, address or, or phone number where you should go to access those rights. Those episodes are accessible on YouTube uh, or on a, a, a website called uh, keepitconstitutional.co.za. We have also launched our new website, uh, fhr.org.za. Thank you very much. You can contact us on smota at fhr.org.za. Thank you. the 24th edition of Time of the Writer Festival, the second year that the, the, the festival that went virtual. And uh, it is indeed exciting that, uh, you know, they're taking it uh, the virtual route second years for the, for the second year uh, in 2021. Uh, a disclaimer is that I live in the township. I love the township, but the sound coming from the outside. For me, it is quite loud and hopefully that you are not able, you, you cannot hear it at all. Uh, we have a great lineup of poets uh, who will be sharing some words for us to, tonight uh, from uh, many corners of Mother Africa. And I'm looking forward for, to that as well. But before that, we have uh, a word, you know, from Dr. Uh, Wamui Mbao who is a lecturer in English studies in Stellenbosch University. He writes short stories and his research interests are in South African post-apartheid literature, architecture and popular culture, and also uh, has accolades for his writings. Uh, help me welcome uh, Dr. Wamui Mbao, who will be talking on is the voice of the poet a contribution to the struggle for social justice or merely an archive of a, mem of a moment in history. Doctor, welcome to the virtual streets. Thank you, thank you very much for having me and good evening to everyone. My topic, uh, as Mo Africa has mentioned, is is voice of the poet a contribution to the struggle for social justice or is it merely an archive of a moment in history? And this is a question about the real world effect of art. And it is one that as a literary critic, I tend to want to treat very cautiously because as soon as you say that you want art to serve 
some purpose other than itself, then you're making it into reportage. And newspapers are generally better at reporting things than poets are. After all, art is about giving people material and things to work with to fulfill whatever needs they have. So I want to answer this guiding question in a short set of remarks by turning first to Audre Lorde, who tells us that poetry is not a luxury. I want to seize on that idea when I say that struggle poetry, and that might go by various names, struggle poetry, political poetry, or civically engaged poetry, is a necessary element in how we catalyze and promote social justice because of how it enables us to engage our own experiences and the experiences of others across time and space. So this is an idea that I want to briefly unlock and turn over, especially given that today, the 21st of September, in addition to 21st of March, sorry, in addition to being um, Human Rights Day is also World Poetry Day. And I think it is important to note how poetry reaffirms what is common about our humanity by revealing connections that are often obscured by the workings of power. Poetry is at its core one of the oldest forms of communication we have. And when we talk about poetry, I'm talking here about a form of communication that often reckons with the unclear and the mystical and transforms those opaque things into knowledge with which we can live through darkness and difficulty. So when we talk about poetry and its role in social situations, we might think of the ways that such poetry intervenes to engage our awareness, to challenge our assumptions about civic space and civic action and who is entitled to those things, and to provoke us to act on behalf of our convictions. I've just edited a collection of South African poetry that turns on the concept of social justice. And that experience reinforced my conviction that the poet cannot be extricated from the network of struggle in which they are entangled, but neither can their work merely be reduced to the role of the archivist or the one who reports after the fact. There are poets whose work communicates something deep and profound about apartheid loss or colonial loss or imperial loss, about the things that freedom has not given us, about the new and continuing struggles faced by women and LGBTQI communities in the post-democratic dispensation. So my goal in editing the collection that I put together was to perpetuate the archive of public ideas through poetry as a living thing, one which generates more thought and especially sustained thought about our place in the world over time. To say this is to note that all our significant moments, political and otherwise, form stories about our place in the universe. And yet often it seems that we need something to bring those stories to life, to remind us of what we felt in those moments or to remind us of what we need to remember to prevent bad moments from transpiring again. The poetry of engagement, political poetry or struggle poetry as we often call it in South Africa, asks us to share the sentiment that the poem expresses or it aims to produce a specific feeling, or even to catalyze action in those who witness it, those who read it, and those who participate in its performance. Is it possible, for instance, we might think, to separate the story of imprisonment under apartheid from Chris van Lake's iconic poem, In Detention, and its heart-rending opening lines he fell from the ninth floor, he hanged himself. He slipped on a piece of soap while washing, he hanged himself. That poem achieves something very simple, but something with immense power, I think. It voices 
a silenced or erased story. It is a testimony that inscribes the truth that authority would prefer to erase through violence. There's a reason then that dictators and people who want to cling to power dislike poets. When ancient cities were sacked, orders were often given that the poets and scribes had their tongues and eyes plucked out, so there would be nobody to give account and nobody to hold authority to account. It is that speaking truth to power that dictators and those who dislike freedom fear. This is why poets were persecuted in Nazi Germany. This is why poets were banned in apartheid South Africa. This is why poets continue to be imprisoned as dissidents and be detained without fair cause in far too many places around the world, even as we speak now. But the voice of the poet in the struggle for social justice, I would argue, is the voice of us all. It is the voice of community. It is the powerful voice raised before the crowd, and it is the graffiti that you catch a flash of on a wall as you make your way home from work or from school. And so I want to close this set of brief remarks with an injunction that the writer and public intellectual Kigura Macharia sets before us, one that, uh, as the kids say, lives rent free in my head. He asks, how will you practice freedom today? How will you practice freedom today? The answer for all of us might begin with poetry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And I used to, I, I like using the phrase that, you know, a poet's tongue lash. And I think you spoke on that. So we really tongue lash. And I'm looking forward to, to readings this evening to hear poets tongue lash. And just a note to the poets uh, that should you like to contribute to that discussion uh, propeller, you're more than welcome uh, just to, you know, share your reflections on it, would, would appreciate that. We are celebrating poetry uh, worldwide after all, right? Um, yes. Well, let's get the formalities out of the way before some poetry. Um, whew. Well, we have a, uh, have one poet down, one poet down, uh, 14, Mobits uh, cannot be joining us this evening. Uh, she's hospitalized at a speedy recovery. Uh, yes, so during this time of uncertainty, you know, our prayers are definitely uh, with the family. Um, we want to acknowledge the University of KwaZulu Natal uh, for coming through as a partner at the National Department of Arts and Culture, Amazwi Museum. Imbiza, General of African Writers, the KZN Department of Art and Culture, French Institute of South Africa, Stand Foundation, Foundation of Human Rights, National Institute of the Humanities and Social Sciences, the Media Partner, uh, which is Imbiza, and also the Technical Partner, Hear My Voice. Thank you so much to all the partners who came through to make this edition of the 24th um, time of the writer happen during a time of a lot of uncertainty. And we appreciate you so much. May you continue to uplift the voices of uh, the literary voices within the creative sector. Starting off the poetry tonight for us, it is Hope Nechivambe was born and raised in Venda in South Africa. Uh, Hope is a creator, a thinker, a speaker, but also uh, she holds a diploma uh, from Oaksfield for radio and television. Uh, she is uh, as an award-winning poet, just a beautiful mind and an impeccable writer from South Africa. Let's welcome Hope Nechivambe. 
Di madya ko, Ana. Ako, oh, di. <laughs> Over to you. Thank you. When someone dies, one, there is a part of the language you easily express yourself in that will lose its meaning. Two, meaning in itself is lost. Three, if you are a person of faith, rage will unfold itself in the strangest of ways. And for a period of time, you will try to withhold yourself from grief. You will remember the verses that kept you on your knees. They will intensify your pain and you will imagine God's hand letting go of yours. This is what it feels like when our prayers are not answered the way we anticipate. When God feels like the reason for the darkness throbbing in your chest. There is an explosion building up, bulking up to shock you. The muttering on your tongue is finding form but you will not like the language it builds on the tip of your silence. By now, you are already accustomed to church folk. You already know what they will say when they visit your house. Your house. You feel pity for your house, how it has housed grieving people before. Even the dog that chewed bones many funerals before has long died. And the people that come to your house to see how you are coping after all these years of loss and death, ask for a plastic bag to carry the bones of the unfinished food to give to their own dogs at home. How time has matured, but between then and now, there is still no blueprint on how to handle the dying of the people we love. A type of madness forms in us when someone dies. There is no wrapping our minds around that kind of absence. How they were here and now they are not. It's the audacity of death for me. How it fondles with us aggressively, toys with us on a first name basis, leaning its leg on our dinner table. It must love to see us this way. I have no words for God. I don't feel ready to talk to him, but still he wakes me up to write poems that might be of help to someone else. Two, when someone dies, part two. The euphemisms we use with children when someone has died are futile, but at the same time, how do you explain death to a three-year-old? Because even at your big age, it still baffles you. How our bodies decay with so much ease, whether death comes abruptly or soft and taking its time, making sure we memorize all its tearing on the parts of our bodies. To a three-year-old who has just lost her beloved father, every day she is waiting for him to come home. Every day she is asking for him. And when you tell her that he is in heaven now, still, she is waiting for him to come back. And eventually with time, she is likely to resent heaven, this place where the people we love don't return from. Where is daddy? Daddy gone? Daddy sick? Daddy left me? Take me to daddy, I want daddy. To not be able to help her with that is the kind of pain I cannot explain. I have given up on trying to make sense of it. There is no sense to it for my human mind. I watch my nephew, almost 18, tucking his pain beneath his neutral face with no idea as to when it will be more tolerable to express it. I cannot tell where he hangs it. But in random moments of his frustration, I can see that pain was never meant to have a place in our bodies or in our hearts or in our mind. I see how sometimes trauma is reserved, is reserved for later in our lives, how it is inevitable. 
and to a degree, there is a light that dims in us when someone dies. This is the thing about grief. It alters us. This is what makes it so hard sometimes to return to the people who love us. We are learning who we have become. There is always an older woman somewhere trying to teach herself silence because she was told that no one would believe her. So she's not sure anymore not sure if it actually happened, wonders if she made it up in her mind somehow, doesn't know how to tell away her bruises or the trauma of her memory. There is a younger woman somewhere learning to inherit that silence because she has seen how abused women are treated. She knows she will be interrogated more than her perpetrator will be made to feel like she was the accomplice, that she asks for it somehow, that her body is a bait, that her body is a trigger, that her body is a sin, that her body caused a sin. There is always an attempt to explain away a man's deeds, to suggest he was possessed, to suggest it was a demon's doing, to suggest he is a decent man at heart, Forget about a man's apology or his remorse unless it is advised by his lawyer. And even then, notice how much of him it takes to spit it out of his mouth. You'd swear he's been separated from something dear to him, something he cannot do without. Notice how often women are told to learn how to dress better, but never anything to the man on how to behave better. Thank you. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. The, the, the unlearning, the relearning, and shaking off of everything else. Hope Nechibambe, thank you. Thank you. Wow, okay. Hopefully we, there are hearts, uh, there are virtual snaps wherever you are watching. And remember to like that particular page uh, because of great things are happening where you're watching. <laughs> you know, for the pages to be part of this, that doing something right. So yeah, uh, I'm, I'm excited. And remember to use the hashtag, hashtag T-O-W-T, time of the writer, yeah? Time of the Rapper 2021. Uh, let's make poetry trend, you know, for once, for once. Let's keep the poetry coming. Wow. Woo. Okay. Let me take you to Kimberly and bring you Limpia Julius, uh, born Go, Go Springbok. And uh, she's an award winner of uh, the Avbo Poetry Competition in Africans and uh, also. She's currently studying a master's uh, that for creative, in creative writing at the University of Free State. And tonight, Olympia is here with us. Welcome to the virtual spaces. Welcome. Bye, Danki. <laughs> Take it away. So the first one I'm going to start is called Omakau. Opetite was ons jachters van wilde dieren. Nou so ons oppassers van bok en skaap het om my kou ver weg gesê. So leer die geschiedenis van my mense. Hierin leer die geschiedenis van my mense som gevat. Hierin wees die gulsigheid van die setlaars mens. Hierin sien jy die wee van die volk. Hoor nou die woord van die hoodnoot. Weg. Weg kyk God. 1949 Fok die liefde verdra alles, kom sê die wet. Fok wit en bruin wat hande anders vast, hou sê baie vir die lavis wat die jere anders ingekleer het, sê baie, sê baie. Fok die liefde verdra alles. Soen om net in donker nacht, vergeet van vast hou in die dag. Vleg om met jou bruin bene los, net nou knip jy voor die landroos. 
Sê baie my kind, sê ma, al het jy lief, skryf op jou pens waarom jou brief. Volk die liefde wat die pa staan vir die system nie erken. Die government sê so, hulle glo ons liefde moet haar kleer ken. Dat kom glo so van boe. Skulp. Prime Minister Foster's first attempt to reconcile differences was to suggest that the particular problem of the colored community be left to the next generation. Adam Small, a brown Afrikaner, speaks. Ek betaal die skuld af vir my ouwersie. Ek werk die wonde toe wat nou nog bloei met wondgare wat ek by een staatsdokter moet loop vraag nie. Ek las die goed aan mekaar wat ek die breek gemaakt het, maar so kom kry het nie. My tande is die stom van groen druive wat voor of kerkvaders geëet het nie. My arms gaan nie die gebeentes vassel van gevosse leerde haat en seer kry nie. Ek gaan nie die massa van my land, my mense, op een paar kilogram luister rug dra nie. Ek onderhandel die skietstakings van dompas en dommel oorloon nie. Niemand gaan aan my vast voorstel wat ek vast of recht moet werkie. Ek is niemand sy marionet of naister nie. Ek kies my slagvelde. Ek kan vaar nie hand me downs van een systeem waarvan ek geen onderdeel was nie. Ek vul hier een blokkie in om my bureaucratie te maak werkie. Ek is nie in die wieg gelee om geneesmiddele uit te vind vir siektes wat ek hier veroorzaak het nie. Ek kies my beloofde land privaat. Ek is gin aangewees in Joshua nie. Ook betaal ek om gewoon gin soos een sylbaar na iemand sy fucking skuld af by een McDonald nie. Want die hem ding. My maas in a babie het gebore en een makkolandse kind. Ek toe dit vrijdag aand is in Toeropoort blauw en koud aan die makwalandse kind. My ma is sier deegbrood en namaste, kou lach en kut, oukiep en beersig mens. Sy kan in nama tel tot tien toe ek nou die dag draai, toe kom ek net by drie. Sy het getrek en vir Kimberly. My saam met haar gevat. As ek terug aan sien ek my poppe huisie maaikies, hulle het amal kinders vry nou en dan getrouwde mans. Ek het gesien wat arm gatgeit aan mens kan doen. Dit word een mak ou kou waar een mans jou afknou. Ek is so vir Kimberly a waister gemaakt, soos hulle die Kimberly te noem. Ek kan nog nooit soos hulle praat. As ek in spring bekom, is ek te stad in Kimberly te nama. My ma sê haar oma was een nama vrou. Die groot mens het onder die skerm gesit en hulle taal gepraat die kinders weggejaag, want het was een groot mens taal. My maak en baie antwoorde. Sy is een goed belese vrou, maar sy het die antwoorde as ek vraag wie die God van die namas is nie. White privilege. Daar sê 28 en 26 gangs in my beerd nie. Hier loop sê en sê rond met broeke wat onder hulle sy gatte haal en gans in hulle rugsakke nie. Daar is die vlaktes wat winde laat waai voorbij maas op julle sy kinderse opgrafte moet staan nie. Nie bullets wat die kind tref nie. A beard sonder nommers en skote, sonder vrouwens wat hulle sy lichame vertik verkoop, sonder mans wat hulle lewe uit die puip uitroop. Daar is devils volk om jaard. Warm water en krane. Kinders wat leer vergrade. A wit jyre, wat die rondloop met die mest die ek wond in sy gesigie, wat die brood vraag oor die draadie, wat die hardloop van rubber bullets van die poeliese afie. Kroes, I have biracial hair because I have biracial blood. I'm not talking about that cute they met and fell in love blood. I'm talking about that slave raped six times by the master birthing six mixed babies, later hung blood. Zora Howard. Mama sê ek moet my kop nas sien, reg uit maak, gladder, dinner, witter maak. Toen nog kroes is as aspris, hoor ek. Daar is genoeg dak en lovely en sun, so ek om die geskiedenis uit jou haare te vee. 
En nu het vergeet wat er voor ouders bij de wortels van jou haar deers en dans. Net een beetje bebelen hier, net een beetje polaudraai daar, net een beetje laat sy ring toch net in jou haar vast het, as hy sy vingers door hulle draai lief kan. Daar was een tijd toe ek in Kimberley in wil pas, toe ek Engels wil praat en manne met spijkarren en wit koffiekarren nachts om. Ek was te kroes om in Kimberley kalle te wees, te glad om op reg kooi te wees, te gemeng om wit te wees. Ek het die as opgestaan met my kroes haare mama, sikkel, sikkel die krulnikke in my haare uitgekam en met die loskomsels op die kam besef, het volk glad wees. Laat sy ring maar in my haare verstrik raak. Ek vind nie die geskiedenis uit my haare nie. Kroes is kroes. Kroes word nooit door die wortel glad nie. A jong voor Westerse kooi vrou met die naam Sarah, wat lang reeds onder die blankes geleef het, is opgehang gevind aan die dak van een skaapstal, Karel Skoeman, kinders van die kompanje. Die aand het die maan nie licht soos een skotteltje waswater gesit. My arms kraal gemaakt om dit wat in my baar gegroe het. Gedink aan wat nog voorlee. En die jou self een kan skuif en vergeet hoekom jou ma jou gekraam het. Bram gegeef vir ou last. Gevra wat er God ook al oor is om die kindsterre toe te vat, om die asem so snot uit die kind uit te syg. My vingers en ribbekas om haar lijf gemaakt. Haar voel stoei en stoei en toestel. Die grond in met my handig en grau. Houd boog oor brand gemaakt soos een bakselbrood. Haar geest die nacht ingesien. My lichaam galg toegevat. So dat die stilte kon kom so dat ek die stilte kon word. Thank you. Oe, Lintia. Just heads up. Trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning. Oh, yeah. Thank you for speaking so much truth and, you know, in your brave voice. In your brave voice. Thank you, Baya. Wow. Wow. Or should I say, Kesa Gangans? Because I'm. Oh, I wish people could see you right now. I'm learning. There's a good friend making us learn. And you know, the Quay language, which is important. One of. It's a language of the South. And. You know, uh, we need to embrace that. And, and thank you for, for incorporating that into your poetry. Uh, this is how, how we learn. And this is how stories, you know, travel yonder, uh, generations after. So thank you so much. Yo, okay. Uh, let's hold space together here. <laughs> let's hold space together. I, yeah, I really need that. I really need uh, for us to hold space together. Uh, whew, let's go back to the poetry. Let's take a turn, shall we? Let's go to Zimbabwe. And I bring you a world-class comedian, poet, and uh, master of ceremonies. And you know, when you, we have heard that, um, that comedians have uh, a straight face. And I think, you know, uh, Andrew is in between. You can never know, you know, just in between. Just there in the in the margins or between the margins, uh, Andrew. Yes. Manheru Kanaka. Manheru Kanaka, I was Makali. In the Dakana, my Tabasa. Lina kai tuta ubwasi shuti soratwa. Ari tuta nda, ari tuta, and that's how. That's how the thread of Africa really connects, you know. Yeah. Uh, we don't feel intimidated by one another because of language. So when you say something, I pick up something. My ancestors yeah. actually come from the border of Zimbabwe. So my Sipedi dialect has a lot of Shona in it. So I, oh, you, okay. you cannot get away. <laughs> the um, one where we Definitely. You are wearing smut, and uh, we are ready for the poetry. Take it away. 
Thank you so much. Um, very glad to be here. Uh, Time of the Rider is such a big festival and um, yeah, this is definitely one of the bucket list items. Thank you for complimenting how I'm dressed. Uh, the comedian in me wants to tell you that uh, this is courtesy of my wife. I'm recently married and as you can tell, uh, because when a person is recently married, they suddenly become very left-handed, you know, even if they need to scratch their right ear there, it's, uh, <laughs> it's all happening from the left. Being married has actually disabused me of certain strange, weird, childish notions that I used to have. For example, I used to think that I had two arms, only to discover that I have this one arm, and then this one here is a pillow that I've been carrying for her for my entire life, which she can use at random, but uh, <laughs> I digress. So um, I'm going to share with you a brief uh, set of poems. The first, before I get into that, I just wanted to say on the discussion of the poet as uh, either an archivist of the moment in time or um, an, uh, a catalyst of what we can do going forward. Um, my two cents is that I'm not, I, it, it's a question that even I have debated internally because I'm not really sure what we are supposed to do or if we are supposed to do anything other than exist within our art form. All I know for certain is that poetry is necessary. And with that in mind, I'm gonna do a funny poem for you before I get onto more serious stuff. This one is called An Ode to Bacon and it will quickly become clear why. Bacon, we never knew you. Yours was the sweet savor of a Saturday morning, scintillating scent transcending space and perhaps time, titillating taste teasing tongue and perhaps mind, placed on plates while I cleared the palate amongst taste buds. You had pride of place. My mouth was your palace. Bacon, you who moved from forbidden fruit to breakfast staple, Oh, the hopeless emptiness when you are absent from the breakfast table, devoured in a flurry of gobble, the gook which howled and munched and gobbled. Now look, all that remains is a plate marked with grease stains and the unspeakable question lingering in our brains. Does it really come from a pig's rear end? Oh, my dear, dear friend, Bacon, we never knew you. And perhaps that was for the best. <laughs> This next poem uh, deals with uh, loss. Um, I think this past two years have been history making in terms of how much loss people have suffered. So the first one is called uh, My Uncle Ben. Was a broken record, stuck on a song, called Good Advice. On Tuesday, the music stopped. Silence. Right. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was denied a visa to a country that I had previously visited. And uh, the assumption was that uh, the difficulties in Zimbabwe would make it such that once I entered into their glorious land, I would never want to come back. I was thinking about that in the context of the discussions around colonialism and imperialism that have happened over the course of this festival. And I uh, thought tonight would be uh, a good time to share what I thought was a poignant poem on that question. It's called Migration request denied, and it's from my book, uh, Man of Letters. She said, Zim is too hard for you to want to return, but hard is what Zim is, or haven't you learned that we are a house made of rock, no mortar, a land that is landlocked, no water, and I was born from this, screaming. The air flowing between my lungs, the same wind blowing between the rungs of the rocks of our great stone monument. And I was made from this, teeming. Within my veins is blood pulling as if by rains to see the world and all that it contains. But I know how to return. I know what it is to want familiar ground for your remains. So maybe, perchance, perhaps, when God made you, he took the fine sand of a dusty beach. And when he made me, igneous rock was all that he had within reach. And he strung me together with fear and wonder so that no matter where I wander, just as the tide turns, I have learned that apart from where I, where I stand, there are parts of who I am that I carry within my brittle bones, like echoes of stick and stones, like beacons leading me home. This next poem, is called structural integrity, a scientific term referring to the ability of a uh, material or structure to be able to maintain uh, its stance when bearing uh, pressure. 
I hate how heavy hope is. In the falling sky is a gathering storm of darkening clouds. As they gather in form, it is heartening shroud. It is taking light from my way, making night from the day. And as the storm brews nowadays, as is the norm, news is coming from both far and near, beating the drums in my ears and letting me know that it is nearly fermented and that my taste buds will soon know the bitter ale of the tale which is told of a titan tormented. Burying land, mass, sea, and boulders, the weight of the entire world resting on the width of the shoulders, drawing from the stream of my consciousness, I sip on my creative juices, contenting myself that even present suffering are things that the creator uses. So I don't speak about the dark thoughts around which my mind keeps turning or the secret passions raging between my spine and sternum, the war on fashion that my sleeves are waging or the beating heart that my ribs are caging. You see, hearts were not meant to be accessories. So I'm airing out these closets, looking for skeletons better suited to the bed, burden of expectation, minding the mind not to meander in the maze of the world's way. Bracing the back to be able to bear the brunt of what the world weighs, but your world weighs heavy. And I am weak. I am weak. I am weakened by the emptiness of my refrigerator, reminding me that there's, I've invested too much in the mere cooling of water and I am drowning in the deep end. I won't mince my words, but I relish Monday mornings because they mark the end of the work week and the start of the weekend wherein I work weak, fingers to the bone, trying to make ends meet court. In the vice-like grip of time's crunches, you realize there really are no such things as free lunches. Not when friends say, hey, have you noticed how Andrew's visits always seem to coincide with Sunday brunch? For these meals, I pay. But currently, dignity is the only currency that life will accept as it pins me face down and plants on my head the premature beginnings of a great crowd. Meanwhile, I'm trying to figure out what it all really means while the debt collector's number keeps my phone ringing. Bringing, bringing the tears out of my mother's pillowcase. Those were precious to me. Washing the weeping blister stains out of my father's gloves. Every day that he works for this family is a labor of love. Looking at my little brother and thinking you deserve better from me. Things they've never heard me say, but thanks to this damn dreamer's disease, I am more than prepared to stand on this stage and put my soul on display. Getting these weights off my chest, bench pressing, striving to become the benchmark, the funniest man on that stage, the winner of that slam. Sometimes I swear it all feels like a big sham, like the many caking lumps of mud that my real name has been dragged through. I suppose one does what one has to. Sitting before you now, I am bare, a walking nervous system. And when I can't stand before the hardships, I knew before his lordship, you see, I am no man of the cloth, but it seems like them and I are cut from the same cloth because even now, my rational mind finds my spirit quite odd because even now, I keep on trusting my God, a God who my grandfather introduced us to. And to my shame, to this day, I am yet to set foot at his grave. When I turned 21, he seemed to say, you're a man now, and he paved the way to heaven. But when I finally go, I'll have my final confrontation with gravity though, and say, is this all that you're good for? I will not tell life that you cannot steal my joy and death. You are going to have to wait. I will leave scars on your horizons and scorch marks on your skies. There will be nothing gentle about my passing. And when I die, you will know that I was here. That count. I stood here. And that counts. The final poem is called Goodbye. Goodbye. Word built like granite, granting more of take than give, made with more of die than live, leaving bitter aftertaste after every time I depart in haste, leaving, leaving off often never feeling the full force of departure, fearful that underneath it, I would come and die, that I would splinter and break, that I would shudder and shake, that I would stumble and fall, that I would crumble and all that would remain in my wake is smithereens and splintered dreams and crimson streams and little things, a collage of brokenness. So I steal myself away, steal myself. 
counting down the days. Thank you, time of the record. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, that comic bone, man. Uh, we needed to start with that <laughs> after Olympia broke those tag uh, tag lashing. Uh, thank you so much, and hopefully that our, our path will cross, you know, soon. Uh, celebrating ten year anniversaries. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, going back to the poetry, yeah. I'm taking you to one of my favorite countries in the continent. I'm taking you to Ghana, and I bring you Bonkua, Grace Nkuruma Bwando, as a, who is a graduate from uh, University of Ghana and holds um, a bachelor's degree in economics with mathematics. So those are the combinations we need in Africa. <laughs> Uh, has been in the in the poetry circles since 2018 alongside uh, Ehala Kasa. And um, she says she's passionate about, you know, volunteering and also believes that uh, there is an artist screaming in every one of us. And I can't agree more. I can't agree more. It is sad, sister. Bon quoi, it is sad. I guess, I guess, I swear. <laughs> uh, yeah, I uh, Yeah. I'm glad that you're sounding good. Let's not waste time and get straight to it. <laughs> okay. So the first poem I'm about to share is titled Just a Girl. I was just a girl when I was broken in two. I was just a girl when the door to my womanhood was opened and slammed a while too long. I was just a girl when my red cotton panty was shoved into my mouth to choke down the peas in my throat. I was just a girl when one by one the petals of my childhood were plugged and left to dry in the sun before my eyes. I was just a girl when I danced the music of adulthood. I was but 11 when he spread my legs wide apart to form a perfect curve around his waist as he drove north and south in my fragile body. His eyes, his eyes were like sharp daggers scraping away the layers of my innocence. Filled with so much disdain, he looked at me like I was the one mistake he never should have made. And his touch, like arrows singing like a bee, he made my innocence his little playground. Like a game of soccer, he, he tossed and turned his balls whenever he pleased. When my flat bosom began to sprout lemons, and my lean hips bloomed gracefully like the queen of the night. He called me a witch, saying I made the stake in his going itch. How could I be more beautiful than the woman who bared me, the woman who came before me? Fat cheeks with a bloated belly, stretched mass like water dripping down a painted wall in all directions. She was once a beautiful damsel too. How could I eat the same fruit as him? I was just a girl once upon a time his pearl. At night, with the uprising of his son, he tiptoes into my room like a thief with one motive. Listen, my skirt begins to pet. Ride me like a cowgirl, he says. I was his prey. But mother, mother, she loved this beast. He was a priest, a man of the people, without blemish. So what would people say? Treating the swells on my face like she was merely applying makeup under her sunken eyes. Daughter, do not provoke him, she says. When, the, when my loud screams were equal to his uneven pants, so much that I could have drowned in the pool of my own tears, she turned away as my gait was misused and my dignity was bruised. I've tried to scrub off the indelible marks his dirty fingers made on my skin a thousand times, but time and time again, reality slaps my naive mind in the face and I remember. It wasn't my body he bruised and threw away like a used sanitary pad. It wasn't my body he marked with his bare teeth as he beat my silence out of me. It wasn't my body he marred as he drove in and out of me like an empty garage. It wasn't my body he stared. Tonight, tonight, like every night, I know he'll come. Tiptoeing into my room like a thief with one motive, he would lift my skirt and begin to pet, ride me like a cowgirl, he would say, I would once again become his prey. But tonight, Tonight I say enough is enough as I hide the knife, 
the key to my freedom under my blood stained yellow pillow. Fat cheese with bloated belly stretch marks like water dripping down a painted wall in all directions. I will make her a widow and fill her life with much sorrow. Sorrow she would never forget. Sorrow I would never regret. I was just a girl when you made me a woman. The second piece is titled, They Don't Write Books About Women Like Her. There's been a lot of um, domestic violence going on in Ghana over the past years. And I took it from an angle which is different from what people normally write about. Seven times. Seven times he broke her and eight times she went back for more. He had hoisted the red flag so high above his head that she had believed it to be her salvation, the wings of her liberation. Shocked, ashamed, she makes excuses for herself to make it okay. She says to herself, she had it coming. It was her fault. It will be better next time. This is the last time. And she convinces herself to limp on his broken promises and drown in his half sincere apologies. You see, they don't write books about women like her. The kind who feed on the pain like it was a ticket to their last Sunday meal. The kind who leave their self wet on abandoned dreams for pity to steal. The kind who screaming in agony day by day leave themselves as prey for the predator to slay, stay because they have everything to lose. Seven times when the sun came up, he swore to take her son away from her. Seven times he had kicked innocent lives out of her womb. Seven times he kicked the light out from her eyes, drowning the sound of her cries with his fist, plunging her into a world of hopeless darkness and eight times she had endured. Eight times she had failed to keep herself at bay, accepting his gifts, allowing herself to drift back into an illusion, a happily never after for the one who lived, the one who survived, the son he swore to take away seven times when the son bared his teeth. No one writes books about women like her, the kind who would never unwrap the gifts of freedom if it were shipped to them in a golden box, the kind who would never know love's real identity, even if it passed them by, the kind who, in spite of all the red flags flapping so high above their heads and the heavy makeup and the blood-stained eyes, the broken lips and the swollen ribs, no one writes books about women like her. The kind who may never live to see another day, but still have the courage to stay. Thank you. Midasi, Midasi, Bonkwa. Mr. Midasi. Midasi. Thank you for speaking your truth. Uh, and I love you. I love your new, your, your new name, <laughs> Bonkwa. Thanks. Uh, it means queen and queen you are. Thank you. Whew, yeah. You you hey, sh you and Livia should have warned us, you know, should have said, you know, uh beware, <laughs> beware. Trigger, 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 trigger. But uh thank you so much. Um I think we did I'm just throwing this in the ocean that we women uh writers really need our own festival, hey. I'm just throwing it in the ocean. I'm just throwing it in the ocean. There's just so much. There's just so much. All over the continent, you know, from Mamilodi uh, to Madagascar, everywhere, everywhere. Whew. All right, let's continue with the poetry. And uh, last but not least, oh, man. So we are ending the last supper. <laughs> the dinner session uh, with this gentle brother from Cameroon, uh, Rodrigo Nzana, and uh, is a writer. And, uh, you know, there, there are names within this poetry streets and they call him, uh, Aaron, I wonder how you pronounce this, is R Aspotrophy and N. Yeah, ne? So we, he will tell us about, about, about this name. But he is a former national spoke, uh, spoken word champion who we have the champ in the house, also a founder of Ndaslam, uh, 
and also one of the leaders of the 237 Paroles and Grand Slam National, uh, National of Cameroon. Uh, bonsoir, brother. Bonsoir, bonsoir tout le monde. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Take it away with some poetry. Yeah. You are our yeah. dessert this evening. <laughs> okay, yes, my name is Rodrigue Jana from Cameroon. Well, uh, my... Uh, can I say my mother language is French, so my, my English is not so good, but uh, I will try for the, for the, yes. Well, I'm very, very happy to be here. Very, very happy to see all those smiling face. I think this is the effect of poetry. <laughs> because uh, for me, poetry is first a therapy, is a... Um, Something we, which permit me to, to meet people, to have a, a smiling face uh, every time. So I will uh, have, um, yes, I will have my first, my first poem, my first text. Um, it's about uh, Nelson Mandela. Um, it's about how I imagine he was feeling in, into the jail, okay? Euh, regarde dans mon cœur, tu n'y verras que de l'amour, mais ne te trompe pas. Un jour, on m'a dit, hé, hey, le sous-homme, arrête de revendiquer, car il n'y a qu'un seul maître sous ces zones. On m'a dit, mais qui es-tu, qui étudie le droit et ose vouloir les dominos face à tes dominants? Alors, face, on m'a dit, commence par rentrer dans cette cellule. On te dit, on va t'éteindre et là, direct, tu sens dans ta tête comme une mèche de désespoir qui s'allume. Regarde dans mon cœur, tu n'y verras que de l'amour, mais ne te trompe pas. Phase 2, pression psychologique. On m'a dit, vous les crépus n'êtes que des rébus. Alors oublie tout ce qui trotte dans ta tête de rebelle. Pauvre inconscient, abandonne. Ton combat est un faux thème. Tu vois, c'est comme comparer de simples chaises à des fauteuils. Dans l'enfer de cet apartheid, c'est vrai que de Pretoria au Cap, les frères ne sont encore souvent pas Cap d'honneur, de courage et de solidarité et solidarité et la menace d'un regard qui insiste c'est vrai que peu sont qui résistent car dans leur tête la peur siffle le sang froid souffle et la fuite est la seule ambition qui souffre mais ma fierté elle fera toujours face malgré les repos froids, les repas fades et les rêves peu fiables Malgré qu'ici, toutes ces matraques qui se brisent sur ta tête te font bien comprendre que quelque part, ta force est un peu faible. Malgré qu'ici, même l'air est peint en noir, le manque de repères fuse. Mais moi, la force de tenir, c'est le sourire de ma Winnie posé là, tout près de mon lit, qui me le perfuse. D'ailleurs, lorsqu'un jour on m'a dit, écoute, on te libère si tu te tais, si tu acceptes. À ma seule réponse, ils ont bien compris que je fais partie de ces gars qui tirent leur force du cœur et non pas de la tête. À peu près, toi, Zhangzhen, toi, Zhangzhen, toi, Zhangzhen, ne te trompe pas. Un jour, notre liberté sortira de cette prison que la bêtise humaine a construite, tu verras. Et tous ceux qui ont fait partie des gardiens, on les vira. Ce sera la phase 3. La liberté, l'égalité, le rêve devenu réalité. D'ailleurs, lorsqu'on m'a dit « écoute », on te libère si tu te tais, si tu acceptes. À ma seule réponse, ils ont bien compris que je fais partie des gars qui tirent leur force du cœur et non pas de la tête. Alors, regarde dans mon cœur. Tu n'y verras que de l'amour, mais ne te trompe pas. Un chef n'abandonne pas le combat, car c'est en s'abandonnant au combat qu'il devient justement un chef. Et d'ailleurs, ce combat, je ne le trouverai jamais lassant, car la force, pas besoin de l'avoir, je la sens. Et si un jour on te demande qui est celui qui ose penser que tous sont égaux en droit d'oser penser, dis-leur qu'ils me verront à cette adresse. Afrique du Sud, pénitencier de Robben Island, prisonnier numéro 466, bar 1964, mon nom est Nelson Mandela. Ok, the second, uh, the second poem I will do. a very big problem you have here because uh, uh, young people do not have um, the authority of the country behind them. So is to ask uh, the authority to look about uh, uh, young people here and around the world and to uh, push them 
to realize their, their dreams and their, their project. Monsieur le ministre, Monsieur le dirigeant, chaque jour je viens, on me demande de repasser, est-ce que je fais dans le repassage Ici, si les génies meurent et lang, et lang, moi je quitte dans l'ordre de passage. On a toqué partout, partout te dit de faire du repassage. Ton projet peut tout ressusciter, mais ta demande d'aide n'a rien suscité. Parce que tu viens de la part de qui, qui, qui l'a eu, tu n'as pas su qui citer. S'il n'y a pas de budget pour les jeunes, alors la priorité c'est quoi Financer le cercueil du pays. Comment construire une nation sans la base Une maison par le toit signée de la plume la plus chère pays. Monsieur le bureau, monsieur le dirigeant, chaque jour je viens, on me demande de repasser ce que je fais dans le repassage. L'esclavage en Libye commence quelque part dans un bureau par une lettre de refus. Pour la jeunesse, tu es devenu le bourreau le jour où tu as vu ce talent et que expressement tu ne l'as pas reçu. Tu es talentueux et puis quoi Est-ce qu'on te donne le lait c'est le Far West pour obtenir le pharo. Alors la jeunesse va supplier le matin très tôt, dossier à main devant le portail des Bao. Mais même là-bas, il faut concourir. Moi, là, j'ai vu des gros corps courir derrière le cortège d'un boss qui sortait du portail haut. On va faire comment Désespoir oblige. On silence en espérant que la vitre de la Mercedes se baisse en silence et que par chance, excellence, te lance. Monsieur le ministre, monsieur le dirigeant. Chaque jour, je viens, on me demande de repasser, est-ce que je fais dans le repassage L'esclavage en Libye, et si on te dira que c'est l'oncle du village qui a appuyé sur la gâchette pour que ton avenir te semble ainsi gâché, que faut-il faire pour être reconnu, pour être porté Nous, dans le slam, on a tout fait. Performance internationale est tout fait et trop fait. Avec derrière nous, mille initiatives positives, mille demandes de soutien, mille réponses négatives consécutives, oui, mille lettres de rejet pourtant. Ce texte, c'est pour tous ces jeunes, ces génies qui ont mu administratif devant leur projet porteur. Je pense à ces étudiants brillants et sans ressources qui attendent toujours que le gars des bourses repasse un jour, partant de là. Peut-être que si on avait plus de conditions adaptées à notre quotidien d'Africain, par exemple plus de lycées agricoles, peut-être serions-nous moins nombreux au chômage, en colère et aigris après l'école. De centralisation, permettez-nous de draguer notre avenir par nos actions, sans avoir toujours à mendier votre acceptation. Marre des mauvais mots de ta femme ou de la matière. Les petits-fils menacent de naître sous le toit de ton pater. Il est temps d'être rentable. Alors prenez au sérieux ce passage fini d'être passif. On ne fera plus de repassage. Toutes tes économies ont séché pour mendier des nationalités européennes, tenter de l'autorité américaine, désormais bâtisseurs et prospères basés en Afrique, que le rêve prenne. Parce que, monsieur le ministre, monsieur le dirigeant, chaque jour je viens, on me demande de repasser. Est-ce que je fais dans le repassage afin qu'aucun jeune ne finisse plus jamais noyé dans la mer, ni en esclavage ne trouve la mort, offrons-nous des pays de perspective, afin que chaque jeune, chaque projet brillant trouve sa place respective. C'est bel et bien cette jeunesse qui fera de cette Afrique une terre prospère et autonome, en gros un lieu un peu respectable. Bénissez-nous chers aînés, nous ne sommes pas de ceux qui cassent, nous on, on casse les difficultés par notre créativité et notre audace. On est capable pas coupable, on est capable, pas coupable, prénom Rodrigue, nom Diana, profession parolier. Thank you. Thank you, merci beaucoup, brother. Uh, we felt you, we felt the agency of government coming and assisting young people. We felt that. We really felt that. Thank you. And may you continue to write, you know, and speak your truth. And we don't, sometimes we take it lightly that um, when a country is in commotion, we, we take speaking freely, lightly. And thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup, brother. Wow. Whew. Oh, man. <laughs> we are done. We had the last supper and we had some nice things, you know, we went to South Africa, we went to Ghana, we went to Kimberley, took a turn, came back, we went to uh, Zimbabwe in, in Johannesburg, you know, <laughs> and we are here. Uh, we, we took a turn to Cameroon as well. And now we are here. We're saying thank you for watching throughout the week, seven days of amazing content. 
big up to the curators of Time of the Writer 24th edition. It was amazing. And the nicest thing is that you can still go and watch and rewatch and rewatch again. And maybe we'll have just a number of, uh, of articles that are born out of this festival because of it was so rich. It was just, you know, it left someone with something and, you know, to, to ponder upon. Woo. Okay, let's mention the sponsor again because of they made this festival happen. Okay. University of KwaZulu-Natal, which houses uh, the Center for Creative Arts, thank you, uh, the National Department uh, of Arts and Culture, Amazu Museum, Indiza, Journal of African Writers, KZN Department of Arts and, of Arts and Culture, the French Institute of South Africa, Spent Foundation, Foundation for Human Rights, National Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, Imbiza Journal for African Writers, and uh, as, a, as a media partner, also a technical partner, hear my voice. I just want to say thank you all for making this edition of Time of the Writer possible. And I just got a note that uh, the quarter of a century edition of Time of the Writer will be happening hybrid. So this is the new normal, people. This is the new normal. Uh, so I, I, I don't want this evening to end, but unfortunately it has to end. <laughs> Thank you so much and have a lovely night. Until then, sorry.